All right, good afternoon. Well, it's uh, the, the last on the schedule. Unfortunately, uh, the, the week has drawn to an end, but we've had a great week of seminars here. Uh, and I think we've got a really great presentation here at the end, a new, new subject, new research uh, ongoing. First, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Dennis Hancock. I get to be the center director for the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center, uh, one of the uh, USDA ARS uh, research facilities around the country, and really excited to uh, be able to help bring these seminars to you every year at World Dairy Expo as part of the team with the World Forage Analysis Super Bowl. Uh, Kevin actually serves in that capacity and helps uh, with the contest and does a great job uh, as uh, one of the committee members. And um, we had decided in talking about this particular topic, we, we wanted to bring in uh, some of the newest, latest and greatest information from an unbiased source. And Kevin has been doing a lot of work on this subject and uh, really excited to, to bring Kevin forward uh, to do that. So with no further ado, Kevin, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dennis. So in agriculture, what I've learned spending a lifetime growing up on a farm and then uh, four years as a high school agricultural instruction um, role and then uh, 23 years here with UW Extension is agriculture, we tend to have things that show up once again. So I've got a photo up here that kind of represents the diversity uh, that I think we used to have. I remember as a uh, young person growing up on the farm, we had alfalfa, we mixed clover, we had some timothy, we put that in a bushel basket and that's what we uh, put out in the field. And we went away from species diversity for a while. We'd see these straight alfalfa stands, that became uh, the rule and uh, it's funny how we're revisiting some of those things. So why is it that we're growing alternative forages? Well, the list is varied but pretty straightforward. We had a lot of winter kill in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, I've talked to a lot of individuals who've been around longer than me, and I've said, was there a year worse than 2019? And the closest I've got is, well, there was a similar year in 62 or 67, but nobody's told me they can recall a worse growing season in Wisconsin then 2019, and so that was dead in the middle of that stretch. We had difficult corn silage growing conditions and harvest in 2018 and 2019. We couldn't get in the fields. We had uh, silage get drier than we would have liked. As far as land viability and suitability for overwintering alfalfa, what I would say is most farmers would tell you, okay, you've got your top tier land, we'll call that the tier one. You've got your top tier two or the middle, middle ground and then you've got that third or bottom tier. And some of that may be land they picked up that the rent was cheap or whatever the case may be. And so we don't have uh, land that's always suitable for alfalfa, but it needs to be productive for us. As far as economics are concerned, I'll share with you a crop enterprise budget as far as the cost of establishing alfalfa. It does not work to have alfalfa serve as an annual forage. Not, not a good thing. The inability to rely on importing forage from western states, I think all we have to do is look west of the Mississippi and what those folks have been putting up with these last uh, few years to know that there are areas where Wisconsin is known to bring hay in, western hay, and uh, the availability of those supplies has definitely been impacted. And then last but not least, in 2020, that's when I started my journey on this alternative forage project where we did a survey across the state. Uh, many of my colleagues and peers contributed to that. And it was at that time that it was like, hmm, we're on to something here. This alternative forage stuff isn't just heifer feed. So farmers will always ask what it is they can do to uh, extend the life of their alfalfa stands. And working for UW, we have a number of recommendations. Make sure your soil test K levels are where they, they belong. As far as your cutting schedule, uh, don't, don't uh, mismanage that. And then obviously leaving winter cover uh, is one of those recommendations. But I think we have all uh, seen in Wisconsin and other states where you can do everything right and you still aren't rewarded for your efforts. And so the problem is when we take a look at uh, this photo here, 
we are having these melt events that happen in December and January, and it's not real difficult to uh, find a time frame or a place where it's the middle of winter and we've got ponding in these fields. Granted, this is uh, not an alfalfa field, but when we take a look at the landscape, it's, it's pretty obvious that it is an issue. As far as uh, the winters are concerned, because we get that warm weather, well, then things melt and we get this. And it's pretty clear that we've got some uh, tissue that's succulent green and there's turgor pressure there, which that should not be happening in January. Interesting thing, all the money on research and development that's spent on alfalfa, not only did this field make it through that winter, it's still in production today. So take that for, for, for what you'd like. Uh, we had a question this morning about meadow fescue. And as you can see, here I've got some samples that I pulled from a large amount of acreage this spring. This was not uh, something that I was intending to do. One of the farms we work with, this uh, Midwest Forage Association um, Alternative Forage Project on, they just happened to be at the table uh, one day for a team meeting and said, yeah, it looks like we've got a problem out in uh, some of our fields. I said, well, I'd be happy to collect some samples, get them down to the plant disease diagnostic lab and see what we can find. Well, we usually collect something that's dead. We look for a transition zone and then you want to send something healthy. Well, this was as close as I could get. And unfortunately, uh, abiotic conditions was the diagnosis. We could not isolate a pathogen or uh, directly identify the cause uh, of the loss in the, the fescue. So this is a picture that uh, helps bring perspective. And the idea is that I, you know, we can Google things, but uh, I had a question in 2019 in November from a farmer. Kevin, how much moisture does uh, snow add to uh, hay, third cutting, if we're going to chop it? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know that UW has a reference for that, so uh, in extension fashion, I went out to the field. We took a swath of the windrow with uh, snow on it. We shook the snow off and then collected that sample, tested it, and uh, the answer is 20%. Uh, so we went from 50% to 70% moisture. So I told them, why don't you rake it? That'll remove some of the snow, but not all of it, and then sile it. And they did that, and it worked out. And yes, this is not soybean stubble. This is uh, hay that's being baled uh, in there. Never seen it beforehand. Hope to never see that again. So as far as cost of establishing alfalfa, we, we know that... Uh, 2021 was a disappointment because it seemed a lot like 2020. I think all of us were ready to move on from all the things that have happened. Well, unfortunately, 2022, farmers were greeted with $12, $1,400 fertilizer. They were greeted with $5, $6 diesel fuel, and that meant we really needed to spend some time on, on these uh, crop enterprise budgets. So if we take a traditional establishment of alfalfa and we have a nurse crop in there and then we have the harvested alfalfa. We're getting about two and a half tons of dry matter off that field. So we generated mm, $470, we could call it $500, whatever number we want to apply. Bottom line is at the uh, end of the day when we establish that alfalfa field, we know we're not going to um, be out of the red the first year. And this number kind of surprised me as far as we were down $554 after that first year. So my comment about we can't treat alfalfa as a uh, annual crop, it's gotten a lot worse than what, what it was economics wise. But that's where some of these alternative forages can come in and especially on some of that land that maybe isn't our top tier, it's our second tier or third tier. When we take a look at this as far as dry matter. We went with 4.8 tons of dry matter and we approximated $1,200 of value there. We had total expense of just under $1,100, so we netted $100 an acre. We could have removed a lot of financial risk on some of this ground by going ahead and selecting a different crop than alfalfa. It wasn't that long ago that when we take a look at uh, what our alfalfa supplies were, it was scary. We had places where, if you take a look at uh, the numbers from USDA, we've been keeping records on hay stocks since 1950. 
So in 70 years, we reached our lowest point here in May 2020. Again, we had bad, bad weather 2018, 2019, worst year. We were, we were really down. So that's where I started getting a lot of calls from farmers saying, Kevin, what can I do? What, what can we um, put in place when we come to the following spring and we have hay fields that look like this? So I think the interesting thing about my time in this area of alternative forages has been we know what the why is. We just don't know the what. And this was talked about earlier today in Matt Aiken's talk as far as um, planting depth. So here, it's very hard to see, but we've got some, some material germinating way down here in the, the seed furrow, and we've got things on top. And so it's very hard to just say, okay, there's going to be a one answer fits all. But back to my analogy of, okay, we know the, the why, but not the what. I realize we're at the World Dairy Expo, the, the Super Bowl for forage is here. We've got the highest uh, quality cattle in the, the uh, land here. I realize this cow may not place in the showing here, but I kind of like an alternative forages to this cow. I pride myself on the fact I grew up on a farm. I taught high school agriculture. I can tell you what the breeds of cows are. I'm looking for someone brave in the audience who wants to tell everybody or demonstrate their bovine knowledge. What breed of cow are we looking at in the stall there? Is anybody brave enough to, to tell me what that is? Let's start with maybe what it's not. Is it a Holstein? No. Okay. Is it a brown Swiss? Color doesn't quite look like a Swiss. How about, how about a Guernsey? Does that look like a Guernsey? Jersey? Milking Shorthorn? Ayrshire? All right, so here's the story behind the, the cow. This is on one of the farms I work with. I work with farmers who have 35 cows to 8,000 cows. So we have diversity in Outagamie County. We're not worried about what this cow is. It's why this cow is in the stall. She milks well. She's low maintenance. When it's time to calve, she doesn't need assistance. She produces milk 305 days like a cow is supposed to. So we've got an animal that basically fits the bill, doesn't require a lot of attention. That's why she's in the stall. As far as alternative forages, we, we don't know all the what, just like we couldn't give you the pedigree on this animal, but we know the why. So this is from 2020. This is that first year I got started in this, and uh, this is in Seymour, Sunny Days Dairy. What we've got here is an absolute jungle. We've got oats in there. We've got peas in there. We've got forage radish in there. We've got red clover in there. We've got Italian ryegrass in there. You had to dig under the canopy to find this stuff. This was crowded out by everything else. And so when you take a look at this, uh, I've got numbers there that we'll, we'll look at as far as what we harvested. But here's what Matt Aikens was referring to as far as composition. We had fine rains and precipitation leading up to the first cutting on that, but once the first cutting came off, Mother Nature turned the water faucet off. It was dry, it was droughty. Can you see the difference in what, what we have going on? We still have some of the forage radish. I could find a little bit of red clover in some low spots, but that's basically a 90% Italian ryegrass stand, and that's what it remained for the rest of the growing season. So when we take a look here, we harvested first cutting on June 28th, August 1st was our second cut, uh, September 5th, and then uh, November 2nd. We'll talk about this cut the following year because this was planned, but unplanned, in it, all at the same time. So as far as harvest is concerned, you can see that we obviously harvested the first stuff um, for silage, but then the other stuff here, we got dry enough. We actually mailed, made baled hay from that ryegrass for the second cutting. Uh, the subsequent cuttings were, were uh, chopped, uh, al although be it on the drier side, they, they were harvested as silage. So as far as our crude protein in that mix, here you can see from first cutting, second cutting, third. By the time we got to fourth, it was extremely dry and droughty, and uh, that probably is a reflection of some nitrogen deficiency, but we averaged uh, uh, in that 15, 16 range. 
when we take a look at ADF and NDF numbers, as far as 20, 30, 40, as far as a protein, ADF, NDF, we could look across the board here and see what happened. Obviously, uh, the numbers drop and we had higher quality feed here in these subsequent cuttings as we would expect. But at the end of the season, we'll see what, the, what that meant as far as the yields. We spend a lot of time talking about low lignin and alfalfa. But if you haven't looked at these numbers or have an appreciation for this, we have a naturally low lignin uh, forage available to us, and it's ryegrass. This was the mix of all those different components in it, and you can see we we're under 4% lignin there. But take a look at the ryegrass, 2.5, 2.22, 1.13, so uh, when we're growing ryegrass, we're putting that stuff in that animal's ration and it's being utilized. So when we take a look at uh, the next items here as far as the sugars, it's extremely high here in that fourth cutting and I think that may have had a contributing factor to why we were able to, to take a cut, another bonus cutting the following spring. As far as ash is concerned, uh, certainly that's a function of the equipment harvested. Uh, dry conditions uh, make that a little more difficult, add to that number. But as far as our uh, relative forage quality is concerned, again, we had what you would expect in that type of mixture when we were straight ryegrass. We were in that 140, 150 range, and that's what Matt showed us this morning as far as some numbers that we could expect. By the time we got to that fourth cutting, we were extremely high, uh, but again, tonnage there was uh, uh, very, very limited. As far as our relative forage quality, when we take digestibility into account, I think we can see we had some really nice numbers. And when it comes to this uh, cutting here, this is where I want to say, this farmer, Matt, talked about a system. With alternative forages, they're usually a part of a system. It's not a one-off. The farmer planted this, and the idea was, I'm going to plant cereal rye in the fall after we're done, and I'll have that to harvest next spring. That farmer did that. The problem is we had a mild winter. Even though the cereal rye germinated, it got outcompeted by the Italian ryegrass. So n Italian rye normally doesn't overwinter uh, at the, the rates or level that this st stuff did, but you could not find any of the, the cereal rye in that stand the following spring. So this really was, the farmer intended to take a spring cutting, he just thought it'd be cereal rye, not Italian rye, which it turned out to be. So. As far as uh, tonnage is concerned, we can talk quality all day, but we know that yield matters. Doesn't matter if we're talking about alfalfa or some other, other crops. If you don't have yield, it's very hard to make that sale to the farmer. And so when we take a look at that first cutting, we had almost 2.2 tons of dry matter in that mix. Once the rain went away, we got a ton of dry matter for the straight um, annual, excuse me, Italian rye grass. By time third crop came along, again, very limited as far as precipitation. This, this farm couldn't get rain to save their life. And here's that fourth cutting that was really, really high as far as some of those quality measures. There was very, very little out there. I think what's important is when we look at, we're, it's not just the milk per ton, we're taking the dry matter yield, and the number that most farmers want to talk about is how much milk per acre am I harvesting from these crops? And you take a look, we had a really nice uh, first cutting there. A lot of that is yield driven, respectable numbers as far as our second cutting. We really fell off as far as our third and fourth, but that was again that function of lack of yield. We had almost two tons of dry matter that following spring, and uh, that feed for overwintering that Italian rye was still extremely high in quality, and you can see the quantity of milk we harvested there. So when we add all this up and we still come up with about 20,000 uh, pounds of milk per acre, I think we can compete with a lot of different crops. So when I talk to nutritionists and I say, how do you get an impression of a feed? What is it that you're looking for? You know, my background being in crops and soils, they say, first thing they're looking at is dry matter. Then they're looking at crude protein. Then they're looking at NDF D30. And then a, a quality measure, whether it's RFQ or milk per ton. So this is a project that 
again, we started with. In 2020, we couldn't travel around freely or do the things we wanted to. So what I did is I reached out to my peers statewide and said, hey, if you've got alternative forages gr being grown, we want to collect some samples. And I want to give a shout out to Matt Aikens because without his help, it would have been hard to organize uh, these samples into the different categories. I expected to have about 80 samples to work with. We ended up with over 140. So it was a big project and, and Matt's help was invaluable as far as trying to figure out the categories. So we separated them to cereal, cereal and Italian rye, cereal legume, cocktail mix. I just threw corn silage in there so we'd have it as a reference point. Uh, grass legume mix, Italian rye grass, legume alfalfa. I had a plot where I had low lignin alfalfa and conventional alfalfa so I pulled and averaged those two again just to have something for s comparison and then our sorghum sedan. So I think what we walk away with is what we heard earlier. Alfalfa, if we're looking for protein, we're not going to have these other alternative forages compete quite at that level. I mean, we've all seen alfalfa at 23, 24, 25. We can get this number higher than that. We're probably not gonna see that with these other items. But when we look at NDFD30, Again, we've got the different categories, cereal, cereal, Italian, rye, and across the board. Boy, the one that jumps out right away is this it Italian ryegrass. My first experience working with Italian rye was in 2005, that spring. 2004 was a very difficult year. We had a lot of bad alfalfa fields, and I had a farmer say, Kevin, I've got 30, 40 30 to 40% alfalfa left in the field. What can I do to patch it or amend it? And uh, we interceded. Italian ryegrass in there and these are characteristics that I saw on feed tests back in 2005 from that summer whether it was young immature stuff or if it was uh, further along as far as its growth stage so I think the point here is that when you manage it correctly you can have a lot of these crops uh, compete with our traditional um, forages when it comes to NDFD30. As far as RFQ is concerned, again, these are all a function of management. We're going to have to get some cooperation from Mother Nature, but at the end of the day, you can see, again, our Italian ryegrass uh, topped the charts as far as the samples that, that we received. We know that uh, we used to have just straight alfalfa. We've got a lot of uh, grass legume mixes out there. We would expect them to be that high. If we let our cereals get a little further along in maturity, we know we're not going to have the same ability to compete as far as RFQ with highly managed uh, forages of um, the traditional nature. But this kind of sums up that if we could just feed the cow corn silage, we wouldn't have to have a need for this discussion. We can't harvest something with more tons of dry matter basically than silage. And when we look at milk per ton, whoops, as far as where we're at, again, it's clearly above others, but you throw in Italian ryegrass here, we're, we're not too far off, and well-managed alfalfa as well as a, a well-managed grass legume mix, again, we're not going to uh, do better than silage, but we're at least in the same ballpark as far as competing. So I thought this was important to include. If you are going to plant alternative forages, there's this attitude that, well, all right, I got some less than ideal land, I'll put this stuff in there, walk away, and I'll come back and harvest it. No, if anything, you need to apply more management to alternative forages, not less. And so if you are gonna incorporate into your cropping plan, I would say, write down what are your goals for that feed. Matt talked about, is this for heifers? Is this for the lactating dairy herd? We can push this alternative forage uh, component into that lactating dairy herd uh, ration, but we have to make sure we do our part to manage correctly. So pick something specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound as far as all right, how, much, how many yields, tons of dry matter are we looking for? How many uh, pounds of milk per ton are we looking at? Three cuttings, four cuttings, what is our schedule going to look like? 
all of those are important to talk about before you uh, are, are ready to make that first cutting. So we basically have four different categories when it comes to forage. You have your establishment goals, which we spend a lot of time on. We talk about seed selection. Uh, we take care of the, the nutrient needs. We make sure that we've got the site prepped as far as uh, uh, soil is concerned. But then we maybe uh, forget some of that once we're in season and harvest management and even with our uh, winter checklist as it relates to some of these uh, crops. So as far as alternative forages, the first place we start is with the Italian ryegrass. We basically can have blends that we uh, would look at and here we've got three different varieties of Italian ryegrass. We've got Merle, Firkin, and Hunter and you can see that those three are in there and that's basically that straight mix. When we talk about these cocktail mixes, now we're looking at different species. So here we've got our ryegrass in there and we still use three different uh, varieties, but we've got hairy vetch, we've got red clover, we've got bursim clover. So now we're mixing these things all up. You can basically make whatever type of alternative forage cocktail mix you want. Uh, the companies that are providing this stuff do do custom mixes and so if there's something uh, that you have as far as your farm conditions or soils or particular fields that you're looking at, if you talk to some of these folks, uh, they, they will definitely tell you there are options available. One of the biggest stumbling blocks early on, and because this was going on when there was a lot of things in the world that were, were uh, not normal anymore, was I was trying to nail people down, okay, are we taking three cuttings or are we taking four cuttings? Where, where are we going here? Well, if we're dealing with a cool season mix, we're trying to plant that before May 20th. And we're using Italian rye, we're using uh, forage tillage rashes, oats, peas, vetch, clover blends, mixes. If we're planting after May 20th, now we've got a warm season mix. So if we're getting in before May 20th, previously you would think that four cuttings is what our goal is. And at least up to this year when, when we were doing our work, that was my belief. So four cuttings was what we were looking at here. If we're planting after May 20th, now we're looking at three cuttings. And here we've got our warm season items as far as the BMR, sorghum Sudan, we've got pearl millet, we've got cow peas. We're still using some of the components that we used in the cool season mixes, but now we've got things that are specifically warm season. So after doing the initial study, finding out that we've got quality there, we've got yield there, let's try and answer some questions that former UW soil scientist Kerry Lebosky was getting, and that is, how do I manage these from a nutrient standpoint? She was getting questions about how much nitrogen to put down, what do we compare this to? In Wisconsin, we have A2809. That's basically guidelines uh, for field crops as far as fertility recommendations uh, in Wisconsin. And there isn't a line in there that says cocktail mixes. So Google knows a lot of stuff, but it only knows what we tell it. So somebody has to do the survey, do the research, do the work, publish materials so it's out there. As far as our goal with this uh, Midwest Forage Research proposal, we were going to uh, take a look at how the plant species composition uh, changes based on response to nitrogen fertilizer, determine the economically optimum end rate. This was before nitrogen and fertilizer took off uh, the way it did. So this actually turned out to even be more important now. Calculate the optimum return and take a look at uh, the comparison between the Italian rye as well as the mixes and then use the project data to update that A2809, the uh, nutrient application guidelines for crops. So another part of this is that Farmers care about their resources. Nobody gets out of bed thinking, how can I do something or uh, engage in an activity that could have an adverse effect on the water that I, my family, my cows, my neighbors, everybody works with. Well, at the time, NR-151 was um, being looked at as far as some proposed rule changes as it related to uh, nitrate and nitrogen management. and. It was important that we were doing this because this was 
the potential area uh, in the state that was going to be affected by some proposed uh, changes to those guidelines. And this never did uh, make it fully through committee in time. It's not codified. There's nothing. Uh, there's, there's information about what they eventually did do with this. But the point is, I think we all know in agriculture that we work in an environment that's different than it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, some might even argue five years ago, and uh, water quality is always something that we need to keep in mind. So when we do this work, it's not just about how much we can grow, it's how much can we grow in an economically viable but environmentally sound manner as well. So here are the, the locations that we went with. We had Seven Oaks Dairy and Opportunity Acres. Uh, basically, we had corn silage, soybean, uh, corn grain as far as previous corn grain, soybean, corn grain similar in that regard. As far as the tillage is concerned, they were both uh, chiseled. Um, as far as our fertilizer is concerned, when we take a look at uh, what we, we had for soil tests, we had uh, pH that was slightly uh, in the alkaline categories. We had or soil organic matters that were similar. Our, our soil test P um, meant that we didn't have, have uh, enough there. In this case, at the Seven Oaks, I had to put down some phosphorus at the time of planting as well as uh, potassium at this site. Uh, the Opportunity Acres, we had more than enough pea, so no supplementation there. I did put down a little bit of uh, uh, potassium at that site as well. We ended up with four cuttings. Uh, here you can see those. I've got these detailed later. And here's the exact mixes from the seed tags that I uh, had up earlier. So here's what our plots looked like. We basically were looking at 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, and 180 as far as our treatment rates. They were uh, uh, replicated four times, complete block. So you wouldn't try and establish alfalfa in this seed bed, would you? I mean, I think we all can, can agree with that. So when it comes to uh, these alternative forages, you have to provide them with the best opportunity to establish because we already have challenges beyond our other crops. If I ask somebody how deep we should be planting corn, we've got some pretty firm numbers. If I ask you how deep we should be planting alfalfa, we've got solid numbers. The problem with these alternative forage crops is that uh, we're working with multiple items. Now, in both cases at these sites, we planted 25 pounds per acre for the Italian ryegrass as well as the cocktail mix. As far as your individual site is concerned, you know, your conditions may differ depending on the crop, but here we are, planting depth. If we're talking about planting um, clover, we're talking about uh, one eighth to maybe uh, one quarter of an inch, we're, we're relatively shallow. When we talk about uh, ryegrass, we're looking at getting that stuff at least a half an inch. When we talk about something like uh, our, our cereal grains, we're looking at an inch, inch and a half. And then you throw vetch in there, vetch would prefer to be at, at uh, one to one and a half inches. So here's what I tell people, is that planting depth is kind of like being a cheese maker in Wisconsin. If cheese making was just science and all you had to do is follow a formula that's written out, well, that, that's great, but cheese making is both a science and an art. And when it comes to planting these things, you have to look at your soil type, you have to look at the moisture, you have to look at the conditions that are present at the time that you're going into that field. These individuals have planted at three quarters of an inch trying to find that happy medium and uh, there just isn't a good recommendation that I can give other than your site and soil conditions along with the mix that you're working with are going to uh, have a lot to do with it. If you have a component that's a major part of it, you may want to look at that first. As far as fertility recommendations, we really don't have them spelled out in A2809, so we basically are using grass hay. That's what we're comparing this stuff to. The questions were asked, as I mentioned earlier, how much end to put down, and then how does that compare to the other things uh, that we have in there as it relates to an alternative forage type mix. So if we're looking at a cool season, Basically 60 days after you plant, you'd harvest, then 30 days, then 30 days, then 45. This worked perfectly last year. This year, 
The second year of our grant project, we're only going to end up taking three cuttings instead of four. So uh, that's the thing about information, it changes. And we do things over multiple sites, over multiple years, different conditions, because we want to see how they, they react. So here we are. Uh, this is uh, 11 p.m. going on midnight on a Sunday night at Seven Oaks when we uh, put that plot in in Calumet County. And then here we are up at uh, Opportunity Acres in O'Connell. Big difference between getting it planted April 24th versus May 7th back in 2021. We did pull deep soil nitrate samples at one foot, two foot, three foot, and that's because we were not just looking for the residual, but what I mentioned earlier, we're not just going to uh, make recommendations about throwing a bunch of nitrogen out there. We want to measure and make sure that the stuff is being used, that it's not leaching out of the soil profile or uh, being lost. And so here we had a Manawa silt loam at the Seven Oaks site. At Opportunity Acres, we had a Salona Asaneki complex. And again, you could tell we were getting three feet down because you can clearly see uh, the different striations in the soil. And yes, uh, we hit water in some of those uh, spots at that depth. So as far as the treatments are concerned, we use Super U. And yes, I used a gram scale because when you have a 10 by 20 plot and you're converting that down from acres, uh, it's a relatively small amount. So you have to be uh, somewhat skilled at uh, your, your placement of that product. But again, from zero all the way to 180 is what our treatments were. Plots were cut at four and a half inches the way the farmer was doing it. So here's our plot site. We basically uh, went in there, cut everything, removed it. Then the farmer comes through, uh, merges stuff, harvests it off, and we go on to our next. So we did two three by three squares on each of these 10 by 20 plots. You can see that uh, represented there. That's Jim from uh, Tilt Agronomy, one of my helpers. Remember what I said about the May 24th planting at Seven Oaks versus the May 7th? In 2021, the first couple weeks of, or excuse me, yes, the first couple weeks of June, it was extremely dry. In fact, it was so dry last year that in the Green Bay area, we had the most consecutive days of 90 degree temperatures since 1988. If you're gonna talk about a drought, Yes, 2012 was dry. Yes, it was a drought, but 88 is the one. Well, by getting that stuff planted late and missing the rains, you can see what we had for stand composition. Here are the flags up at the Opportunity Acres. But once you pulled the canopy away, it was there. The problem is we just had a ton of we un uninvited guests in the form of the weeds that uh, were present in that first cutting. And so here you can see a wider view. We definitely had the, the desirables that we put in the ground, but we had to get past that first cutting as a result. So again, at Opportunity Acres, uh, we, we basically uh, harvested on the 15th of July, one month later on the 13th of of August, then we were September 7th, and then the final cutting came off uh, in November. As far as uh, Seven Oaks, July 5th, July 26th, I, I suggested that we wait longer, but because it was so dry, the farmer wanted to make baled hay. That was a mistake, and uh, that's been corrected this year. But again, we harvested end of, end of August and then the end of October at that. So when we take a look at the treatments, the 60 um, pounds per, per acre versus the 180, we basically had half the amount of N being put on in each application. So maybe if it was darker, uh, you'd be able to tell, but we definitely have much darker, robust forage here than what we have here. You can kind of see the density isn't uh, quite, quite as much. As far as the zero pounds, here you can see we've got the cocktail mix as far as zero, and here we've got the ryegrass. Pretty simple. If you're growing grass and you're not going to feed it nitrogen, it's not going to grow. Here's where we need to do multiple years. Matt was talking this morning about, well, because Matt was at this site, he saw this firsthand that, wow, we're planting this cocktail mix, and what's the point of having these legumes if they're not going to do anything? Well, again, we went periods where it was extremely dry for three, four weeks, then we'd get four or five inches of rain, then we'd go three, four weeks of drought. So this stuff never really had the chance to establish. In this year's plots, the zero rates are full of legumes. So if you were to make a decision based off of just what you saw there, 
it really doesn't fit what, what we might see over multiple sites in multiple years. So here's 90 pounds versus 120. This is at Opportunity Acres. Here's 150 versus 180. And I picked these because here's where you could just see the last remnants of some legumes in there at 90 pounds. Once you put down 120, 150, 180, that Italian ryegrass, it's crowding out the other things that are, that are in there. I mean, we were harvesting uh, pretty much a, a, an Italian rye that had some legumes that survived, but they weren't thriving because they were being outcompeted. So at the Seven Oaks site, it did improve later in the season. So back to that zero plot, we did see more legumes, 30 pounds, it did diminish it, 60 pounds again. When you give that ryegrass the uh, competitive edge over the legumes, this shouldn't be a surprise. Nor is this, that if you're feeding a site heavy nitrogen, uh, that Italian rye is aggressive enough that it's gonna crowd that other stuff out. So. Matt discussed this earlier today as well. When you're talking about uh, ensiling these forages, length of cut matters when it comes to uh, dry matter or moisture that you're ensiling. Alternative forage crops still need to have good preservation practices adhered to, and uh, this was one of the sites up in Shawano County from the 2020 survey uh, when I was collecting data up here. This is a warm season mix, so this is BMR, sorghum sudan, this is uh, uh, ryegrass, and there was vetch and red clover in the mix, but you just couldn't find them. A, it probably wasn't planted deep enough for the vetch. It was probably too, too uh, deep for the uh, um, red clover, but we were extre extremely dry in that situation as well. So after all of that, you're probably thinking, are you going to tell us what you found? Yes. So here we are, as far as our nitrogen rates, uh, looking at each of those sites individually, and big thanks to uh, John Jones, soil, soil scientist, UW, and Kerry Lebowski, soil scientist, formerly uh, UW, because they're the ones who performed the statistical analysis and developed uh, the charts that you see here. So. When we take a look at the Italian ryegrass, we can see as we increase our nitrogen rate, we're on a pretty steady incline. And here we go. What we're looking for is where is that point of diminishing returns? Well, we can see that somewhere between 150 and 180, we find it. And we find it not only in the ryegrass, but the cocktail mix at the two Seven Oaks sites. What's interesting is that when we take a look at Opportunity Acres, we start and we keep moving along here and we get to 180 and we don't see a decline. So at this point, we really know that, uh, all right, we're not seeing a reduction. You know, we can't say that you would have gotten more yield had we applied additional nitrogen. All we can say is at this site, 180, 180 units of N was the economic uh, optimum return on our nitrogen, whereas at these two sites we can see uh, for dry matter yield, which is our green bar, it was 165 and uh, 154. So the cocktail mix and the Italian ryegrass differed slightly, but if you call it 160, we're good. When we took a look at milk per acre, again, 161, 160, so we're pretty consistent. And one of the things that I was told that we had to do this research and we had to look at this is because we had people who weren't agronomists who were telling people to put more nitrogen out because it would increase the quality of the feed. If we were seeing an increase in milk per ton or the quality of these feeds, would they track parallel to these or should we see something different happening? If the feed quality is getting better, I would argue that these lines should uh, be increasing at an increasing rate. We didn't see that. So at least in the 2021 data, end fertilization really had little impact on milk per ton. Our dry matter drives the milk per acre, as you can see they're correlated. The economic optimum uh, nitrogen rate basically was similar for dry matter or milk per ton, and the ENOR was greater than what's in A2809, which is, which is 130 units. So by doing this work, we already know what we currently have. It doesn't fit. Here we have the uh, initial soil, soil samples that were pulled for nitrogen. So 50 is our background. 
So we had approximately 130 here, 130 minus 50 gave us 80 additional units here. Let's just call it 95, 95 minus 50, we had 45 units. Here we'll call this 155, 150, five minus 50. We had 105 units of nitrogen in the soil before we even put the nitrogen treatments down. But after we harvested the cuttings, we came back at uh, each of these sites and basically our nitrogen levels had returned to the background of 50 pounds uh, of nitrogen per, per uh, acre. So what it told us is that at 180 pounds, we were not applying a, an excessive amount of nitrogen to these sites. There wasn't anything uh, going to waste. So because we did not find uh, the e economic optimum nitrogen rate at 180. This year, this is what we have out in the fields right now. We added 215, 260, and 305. So we're determined to find uh, where that change is or where, where we start to see diminishing returns. So as far as the uh, summary is concerned, amount of nitrogen on the Italian rye or forage mix was greater than what we currently have available to suggest to people. We did not see an increase in the quality of the forage based on higher nitrogen applications. Uh, profitable dry matter uh, rates for N were similar to uh, milk per acre. And when rates are applied at less than EONR, soil nitrate remaining in the profile, after harvest is about background. Again, it receded back to that 50 units. We need to do additional work uh, on this as far as N uptake use and efficiency and compare that to uh, dry matter yields in both alfalfa and corn silage. Also have to compare these uh, to straight alfalfa since that's what we're typically replacing and we're in that second year of the study right now. So uh, thanks to all the people who supported this project. It would be the Midwest Forage Association, Seven Oaks Dairy Opportunity Acres, Tilt Agronomy, Dairyland Labs, Egg Source Laboratories, Byron Seeds, Country Visions uh, Co-op, uh, Knutes and Crop Consulting, and the Outagamey Forage Council. So with that, I will take any questions. I suspect I went a little longer than I should have. I either did really good or really bad if there's no question, so I'm not sure which it is. Oh, yeah, no, that, uh, so, so things like lime were prorated over, over the, oh, Mike, Mike had asked as far as the alfalfa budget, the new seeding budget that I had showed, if uh, things were prorated over time or all accounted for at once. With lime, we, we prorated that over, over uh, three, four years, whereas no, for the, the, the fertilizer inputs were, were just for that establishment year. And I'd have to go back and look, but it, you know, 200 pounds of potash or whatever, that was all figured in. That, I think that's the key. When we look at the, the graphs that I had and the economic optimum nitrogen uh, rates, we were using 40 cent nitrogen because remember, we're back in fall 2020 using that pricing, getting ready for 2021. We went from 40 cent nitrogen to a dollar to a dollar 40. I had farmers in October last year, I convinced to price nitrogen at 75. It was like pulling teeth. Boy, they were happy this spring when everybody else was paying a dollar, a dollar forty. And that's going to have to be something we look at closer because of the end need. And when I priced nitrogen about seven, ten days ago in my home county, urea gives us about ninety-six cents per unit as far as the end cost on that. So we're at about about a buck. So we're two and a half times what it was with the study, but we're down from where where our highs were, where farmers were. So lots of moving parts here, but that's what makes this job interesting. It's never boring. <laughs> Thank you for the invite, Dennis. Thanks again, and, and as you uh, leave, if you haven't already gotten one of these cards, it does have the uh, website for the videos that have been recorded here. Not only uh, one of these actually is for uh, the, the uh, YouTube channel dedicated to these videos, 
And then there's also a link to the videos that we do for the webinars through the center as well. So I encourage you to check those out and keep abreast of uh, what's happening at the center as well. Thanks everyone for your time and attention this afternoon and a great uh, set of seminar speakers uh, uh, this whole week. So thanks and uh, we'll see you again next year.